Hi everyone, welcome back to my next video. Today we're going to meet Karen, who seems to have an adventurous heart. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we've, you know, we've gotten to know each other a bit, and you have spent a lot of time traveling and footloose and fancy free. Uh, how, tell us your story. How did you end up with such an adventurous heart? Do you have any ideas? Well, I do think that I have the adventurous gene. Um, I know of at least two or three adventurers back in my gene pool. I have itchy feet. I, you know, now that I'm not having to go to work every day, you know, there has to be a really huge reason for me to stay in town. I am looking forward to going back to the land in September and have autumn over in the Hemas. In the Hemas? That's, mm -hmm. oh, that's the mountains? That's what I call that. It's San Diego Canyon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's not that far from here, but um, it's a beautiful Red Rock Canyon. Um, you'll see. Yeah, I'm going to drive there. it today. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and uh, live up there in the mesas. And do you stay on BLM or National Forest land? No, it's private land, oh. privately owned, um, but I do uh, trade to stay there. So you are, uh, that's what you do in the summer. Where do you do go in the winter then? Sometimes I go to California. I have friends who live on Monterey Peninsula in Pacific Grove. Just a walk to the beach. Oh, wow. Nice. Oh, it's so, so beautiful and so different from here. Um, but it's it's in town, but it's right by the ocean. And so you're in a casita. This is a casita freedom model. We'll mm -hmm. take a look at it during the tour. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's beautiful. It's just really nice. It's an O2, and um, it's the Freedom Deluxe. Freedom is the floor plan. That means it has these wonderful captain's chairs. So this is this is the floor plan that I wanted, and I got it. And it's an O2. I bought it in 11, so it was nine years old, and I paid $7,500 for my home. That was a very good deal. It was. Casitas are expensive. It was. They really hold their value. Yeah. So you've been full-timing since uh, 11, 2011? Right. And But before then, most of your life, you had traveled on and off. Tell me, Tell me a little bit about that. You I had. Okay. Well, I... I I was thinking about that, and what it looks like here is there's that old hippie term, dropping out, which to me means not having a corporate job, right? I mean, I, I, I lived in buildings, but I didn't do corporate work. So I first dropped out in 1971. I left Chicago and went to southwest Wisconsin and picked apples. Lived in a hippie commune that was loosely formed around a rock and roll band. And I picked apples and worked in a Christmas tree plantation and a tree nursery. Um, did that for five years. It was great. So you really were a hippie in every sense of the word. I guess so. I guess I still am. Um, yeah, that was great. I really loved it. It was good hard work. It made me strong, you know, set me up good for later life. Um, so I did that till 76. Uh, I went to Connecticut and lived in the woods in a tent that summer. I uh, met a fellow and said, well, come back to pick apples with me. And we picked apples, and then he said, let's go to California and pick citrus for the winter. By the time, oh, oh so we had this um, red international harvester pickup truck. And we got some old barn wood, and we built a little camper shell on the back, and we hit the road. And uh, <laughs> we got to Venice, California, and found out that the, 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 the crop had been frozen. There was a frost, and there was no work. So um, he left, and I stayed and, and lived in the truck in the camper at uh, Rose Avenue Beach in Venice. Ended up spending 10 years in California in a building not in my truck, uh, <laughs> right? And, so you and, had times when you lived in a home. Right, so, so then I dropped back in, and I got, got a corporate job with benefits, which, you know, it's nice, you know, medical and dental and paid time off. some Social off. Security. Got a little Social Security there going on. In 1986, I heard about um, a Native land rights issue um, up in Arizona at Big Mountain. And they were asking for non-Indian observers to come and witness and to help out, you know, on the land. Um, so I decided it was time to leave the city, and um, and I got a big mushroom tent, 
um, put my stuff in storage and I went up there and herded sheep for about eight months and lived in my tent. And then when there were big gatherings, I would help in the kitchen or, you know, tie up sage bundles or for ceremony or just do whatever to, to help out, you know, with the people. And then I dropped back in and I got a, another straight job in Flagstaff and did that until 1995. I was sick of it. So that was about, that seems like a pattern. That's about eight or ten years about all you can stomach of normal <laughs> right, living. And right. then you got to get it out. It is, it is. Uh, my friend over in, in Hemis, I, I was crying around about, I hate my job. And he said, well, come over here. He said, I just got my mom out of, out of like the nursing home and I built an addition onto the house and I brought her home. You can come be the home health aide. <laughs> Never done it before. You know, so then I left Flagstaff, quit the fancy job, moved into the household, into a trailer in his front yard. I delivered the mail for a while, which is beautiful up there. It's a hundred mile round trip, rural ride every day in the mountains. Gorgeous. I had a, had a trailer in Flagstaff, but a big one, like way bigger than I would ever want to have to pull. But a friend of mine pulled it over to the Hamas for me. And I lived in that for a while. And then the village said, you can't live in a trailer in the village limits. You can't live in an RV. You know how they like to do that. We had community theater and I ended up sleeping on the stage at night in the community theater little building. And there was a little side room and I turned that into a secondhand store and I had that for a while. You know, you just do whatever you have to to make some money. Broke my arm, ended up in Phoenix for 20 months. That was a little freaky. Ended up working in a call center, which I could do because I could type well with one hand. Finally got out of Phoenix, got back to Albuquerque. Got a straight job. Another straight job. Anyway, as fortune would have it, in 2007, I got laid off. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> they kicked me out. I didn't have to drop out. I got booted out. It's, you know, the, the straight world sucks you in. It does. With, with so much. <laughs> it, it, it's easy and it's pleasant and it's comfortable <laughs> and we just find ourselves doing it. It's so easy. But it's painful. It's horrible. It's, it hurts. It hurts the most important parts of, of us. Yes. It does. So, so yeah, due to circumstances in the company, um, I was laid off. They paid me to go away. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> a week later, I got injured, which started my whole disability thing. And, you know, it, it looks like a bad thing, but but how great, because now, like, I don't have to go to work, and I'm free. And my, my life's a little inconvenient sometimes. I have chronic pain. So you had a, a back injury that made it just impossible for you to work well yeah what happened was the back injury made me aware um well I, I was already aware that i have severe osteoporosis but the back injury actually i think is what started the compression fractures in my spine i'm not sure if that's true but i shrunk three inches so so i'm a little old lady living in a trailer and you know what is like beautiful so i put in for disability and i ended up waiting two and a half years for the government to decide that my doctors were right. And during that two and a half years, I was basically homeless. So I did like couch surfing, you know, living with different friends and relatives. At the last eight months of, of, of waiting, I ended up living in a Saturn station wagon in the city. And at some point, I heard about Casita trailers, fiberglass trailers. So I, I started looking into fiberglass trailers and then I started thinking about tow vehicles and and I thought about it for a long time and I and I decided what I wanted. I wanted a Toyota Tacoma six cylinder with a camper shell on the back that was high enough to build a platform over the wheel wells and sit up on the bed in the back. And I wanted a 17 foot Freedom Deluxe because I like the comfy chairs exactly what I got. I had put in for housing and it took a long time but finally the housing came together and we got an apartment 
low income housing. Yeah, low income housing. By and by, the disability claim went through. I suddenly was on Medicare. Suddenly there was money coming in. Not a lot, but you know what? It was enough. And then I got my settlement and I paid cash for my trailer and I financed my truck. So we moved out of the apartment and got in the truck and hit the road and went to West Virginia to see family. And I got this email one day and this guy asked me, are you still, did you find a casita? Are you still looking? And I, and I emailed back and I said, well, I'm still looking. And he says, well, I'm over here in New Mexico of all places. And I have one. And he was willing to hold it for two weeks while I made my way back. So in November, I bought my trailer. So from August to November, it was just like the truck and my sister's couch and like that. And so after all these years, a lifetime of being on and off the road in the last five full time, do you have any regrets? Anything you would do differently? Well, I can't think of any. So you're satisfied with a life as a nomad? Oh, yeah. Uh, my only regret is, I mean, it's not a regret. I'm still alive. I want to just go more. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that would be like a bigger budget to allow you to travel more? Well, more, more gas money. So you support yourself <laughs> with your disability, and you work and trade uh, as a, a caretaker in the summer. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other in income? Uh, I have a hobby. I buy secondhand sheets, cotton flannel and, and regular, and I tear them into strips about an inch and a half wide, and that's my yarn, and I crochet rag rugs. Beautiful rag rugs. One more question I'd like to ask you is, all your life, you thought, well, I'll go do this, and just boom, you went and did it. You were almost fearless. Do you have any, were you, or were you mm. fearful? I'm really good at, like, making do with what's at hand including my surroundings. You had a faith that it would be all right. I, it, that never really, it wasn't really ever that. That never occurred to me that it might not. It was like, if I could figure out a way to do it, then then why not? So were you, were I almost you fearless? Didn't, I almost didn't have the notion of, of a limitation in a way. Yeah. That's like how my urge to live shows up is like, go do this and go check that out and why not? But it, that's kind of like you just be aware of your surroundings and what's going on and, and sometimes it's smart to go somewhere else. Have you had any bad things happen to you? I mean, um, harmful things from other people? I'm been threatened with a gun once. And I'm happy to say that it pissed me off. It didn't uh -huh. scare me. So the one bad thing, in fact, was encouraging to you instead of uh, discouraging. Yeah. Do you have any messages for the many women who are out here, young women who, as young as you were when you started, just being footloose and fancy free, or women your age now, is this a life you'd recommend for them? I think it's not for everybody, but if it feels like it's for you, trust yourself and know that you're smart and that you are capable of a lot more probably than you think you can do at this point. You can do it. Get out there and do it if that's what it feels like you want to do. I mean, try it. What have you got to lose, you know? Don't be afraid. Be smart, but don't be afraid. And if you do feel afraid, kind of pay attention to it, you know, and take a look around you and see if there's a good reason for it. Yeah, but, yeah, be smart, be alert. Go have fun. <laughs> be smart, be alert, go have fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good motto. That's kind of the motto of your whole life, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, Karen, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And uh, I just really, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope you've learned something from this and gained something. Uh, be sure and, and like us in, on uh, YouTube and subscribe to our channel. And we'll talk to you later.